when I was in college, I went to Texas A&M, large, large university, um, and there was this one girl that everybody knew on campus. <laughs> and we had, nobody knew her name, we just knew she was Cape Girl. <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah. She was oh, yeah. Cape Girl. Yeah, like, she did. It was just a, it, she was just kind of a fixture on campus. Like, you would see her everywhere with this huge black cape and, like, one of those big old, like, wizard collars. Like, it, she wore that. She wore it everywhere. But I never knew her name. <laughs> None of my friends ever knew her name. We just, we would see her just sauntering down the side with her cape flowing in the background. You know, and some of you guys, you hear Potter fans, I get it. You know, capes are cool, wonderful. But, like, this girl, she stood out. She was so different. Because, like, at A&M, you wear, like, maroon everywhere you go. Not a big black flowing cape. It just, it didn't quite fit. You know, and especially when you see like a bunch of guys in the corps that are wearing their military style uniforms everywhere, and then everybody else is wearing something that says Texas A&M. Cape girl stood out with her wizard cape in the dining hall, in class, walking anywhere. Never saw her at the games, but you would always see cape girl on campus. And you know, the thing about that is, I mean, you kind of giggle, you kind of sneak, because you, you can picture what that looks like in your mind, right? You can picture this girl just walking around like, I don't care, hey, you're going with me. And her cake's just like, you know? You can picture that because it looks different. Like, in your mind, it's like, that's not quite normal. And you know, most of the time, we would rather fit in than be different like that. And some of you, in the, and I know how this goes, because when I was in your shoes, when people would say, we'd rather fit in, I'd be like, no, I, I like being different. And I'd point out all the reasons why I was, and be like, no, see, I played extreme croquet, and I write poetry, and I invented post-its or whatever. You know, I didn't. Uh, but you, you, you pride yourself on that, and you guys that are like that, you're like, oh, I am different. <laughs> see? But you're, you're fine with that, as long as other people are different with you, which is fitting in. Most of the time, we would rather fit in than to stand out and be different. But when it comes to our faith in Jesus, we are called to be set apart. All right, so I want to remind you guys of the definition of resilience here. It's the property of a material that enables it to resume its original shape or position after being bent, stretched, or compressed. It's also known as elasticity, which is why we have this design behind us. It's being pressed, but then being able to bounce back into your original shape. Okay? So we're in this series called Resilience when faith won't fail because it's easy to be shaken when trials come. Especially when you know that you're called to be set apart because of your faith in Jesus. That is going to invite trial. Now, we've already seen that faith won't fail when we're focused on Jesus. I want to show you another way today how faith won't fail. So go to 1 Peter chapter 1 again, verses 14 through 19 and 22 through 25. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 19 and 22 through 25. While you guys are turning there, I'll be right back. All right, everybody there? You got to look at it. Uh, all right, we're almost there. First Peter is one of those skinny ones towards the back. It's real hard to miss. They're real easy to miss, real hard to find. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> First Peter 1, 14 through 19, and 22 through 25, it says this. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Now skip to 22. 
Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for one another, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. So why am I telling you this? Why are we here? Well, because of this. This is the point. Our faith won't fail when we live a life set apart for God. Last week we said our faith won't fail when we focus on Jesus. Now we're going to talk about how our faith won't fail when we live a life set apart for God. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the word. We thank you for just the encouragement that we're going to receive from this. I pray that no students, no adult in this room, nobody watching this video later feels a burden of I have to as a result of what we hear today, but that they feel the freedom of the gospel and the freedom to pursue a set-apart, obedient, holy life. Jesus, make that clear to them. Let me understand that today. We love you. In your name, amen. All right, so the first thing that we see um, in this passage is it talks about a way of life that is opposite of holiness. It talks about a way of life that's ignorant and empty. Okay? Um, in uh, verse 14, look at what verse 14 says. It says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in what? Ignorance. Now look at 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from what? The empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. Now here's the thing about ignorant people. <clears throat> that just sounds like a start of a great joke. Uh, the thing about ignorant people is the ignorant do what's easy. It's kind of like some of these pictures here. Catch that? The ignorant do what's easy. They'd rather just sit on the box the chair came in than build the chair. They'd rather put a post-it note on the clock than actually reset the clock. They'd rather put Lego bricks where real bricks should go. <laughs> Which is mighty impressive, all those still ignorant, all right? The ignorant do what's easy. It's, it's a lot easier to build Legos than to learn masonry, right? Yeah, but the ignorant do what's easy, all right? And it says in verse 14, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, all right? So evil desires are what? They're easy. It's You say, I want, so I get what I want. I want her, so I'm going to do shameful things to get her attention. I want this, so I'm going to steal this. I want Netflix for free, so I'm going to borrow somebody's password. I want, so I take what I want. That's the easy thing. Ignorant people always find what's easy. Now, the thing about us is we try to justify that, and we say, oh, it's really inefficient. Uh, some of you guys are like, oh, it's just, it's, it's easy. Yeah, we're supposed to figure out the easier way. That's what technology is. That's why we're not driving horses anymore. We have Apple Watches flying through the atmosphere. You know? <laughs> Some of you guys, are, you're, you'll get there. Uh, it's cool. But the ignorant do what's easy, and evil desires are those easy things, and that way of life that we have when we live in ignorance is we just take what we want because it's easy to get. We don't want to stand for what's right. We want to take what's easy. Okay? Now, the empty way of life, that's the second thing that we see. It wants success without changing anything. It's kind of like some of these, it's kind of like weight loss pills or dating apps. All right, weight loss pills, hey, I'm guilty of that. Man. When I was in college and I put on all my weight, I, I bought myself a bottle of hydroxy cut, and I was like, I'm going to be ripped like the guy on the bottle. And I was like, nah, I'm really just hungry. <laughs> you know? It didn't work. It's just like, Dr. Allen's like, this is going to burn fat fast, and you don't have to diet. You don't have to exercise. Just take one of these, and something that's going to go, and just fly away and turn into, like, fairy dust or something. You know? That's, but that's the, the empty way of life, is saying that I want success, but I don't want to do anything different with my life. I want to put one of those pills as a crushed up topping on my bacon double cheeseburger from five minutes. You know, like I want that to work, but ugh, unfortunately it doesn't. You know, or else we got these dating apps where it's like, oh, I just can't find anybody. All the good guys are both. Like, you put them in the friend zone. Get them out of the friend zone. You don't got to complain anymore. All right, but then you get on these dating apps. Thank you. Come on. Get out of the phone. Yes. Anybody? Any fellas? Have you, have you, you fellas ever said nice guys always finish last? Anybody ever said that? 
Hey, the truth of that is boring guys finish last, all right? So don't be boring, am I right, ladies? Okay, now, here's the thing about dating apps, or like the bar scene that some of my family members are so prone to. They keep going back to the same thing, expecting different results, and they end up getting divorced or dumped or whatever over and over and over again. And you know what the definition of insanity is? It's doing the same exact thing and expecting different results. Okay? That is what an empty way of life is. That is what we are, apart from the gospel, is we live in this ignorance and this emptiness, and we want things to change, but we refuse the one thing that we know will change it, and that's Jesus. We don't want him. We would rather go to porn sites. We would rather go to dating apps. We would rather use Tinder for other we would rather use Tumblr for things other than blogging. We would rather use our, our phones to text pictures of ourselves. I mean, come on. We don't need that. That is ignorant and empty. What we need is Jesus to rescue us from that ignorance and emptiness and give us a purpose, give us a direction, give us a resilience in our soul that doesn't bend and crack when the pressures come. We need to bounce back from that kind of stuff, guys. We give in way too easy. Way too easy. So the question that you've got to answer is do you want to do what's easy or what's right? See, when I was in high school, here's I'm going to illustrate this a couple of ways. When I was in high school, a buddy of mine, I've, I've never been in a wreck where I was the driver, but I've been in several where I was a passenger. And one of my buddies was driving in Houston. We get on the interstate, and there was this, like, yeah, I mean, you've been to big cities where it's like that roller coaster, like interstate intersecting. It's just, it's crazy. And he's just coming on and merging into traffic on one of these like 700 lane freeways. And this guy comes in and we see him just barreling down. Cuts the guy off two cars in front of us and smokes just starts flying from squealing tires. Just crunch, crunch, crunch. And then here comes our turn. There's nowhere to go. Crunch. And then we're all, I'm just like, guys. Brace yourselves, you know, like those like movie scenes and then crunch behind us and then crunch behind us. There's like seven cars in this pileup. And we're sitting there just like sandwiched in between all of these. And the guy in front of us throws open his door, falls out onto the pavement with blood coming out of his head. And we're like, oh my god, like it was crazy intense. And it's just like, I mean, have you ever been in Iraq, anybody? Yeah, you, when you get out of it, you're just like, oh like you just can't stop shaking. It's one of those, like, you just get so much adrenaline built up. And after this happened, we looked around, and we're like, hey, we're fine, everybody's okay. And my buddy was like, dude, we are so getting drunk tonight. And I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to join you. Initially, I took that easy route. I was like, yeah, that's the only thing that's going to calm me down, because, whoa, I was shaking up. I didn't get a scratch on my body. I'm like, hey, it's an excuse. <laughs> what? No. That was what my initial reaction was, was, yes, I want that. That's easy. That's going to suppress these feelings, these emotions. But because of my conviction and my faith in Christ, I had to do what was hard. I had to do what was right and remain obedient to what I know God had called me to and not give in to what was easy. Another way to illustrate this, there's a, one of my favorite movies, Lone Survivor. You guys seen this? Great movie. I'm going to show you a clip from when they get encountered with this decision to do what's easier, do what's right. Sure I killed 20 Marines last week. 20. We let him go. 20 more will die next week. 40 more the week after that. Our job is to stop Shaw. And why do these men have the right to dictate how we do our job? Rules of engagement says we cannot touch them. I understand. And I don't care. I care about you. I care about you. I care about you. I care about you. We can't do it. Look at that soldier. Better. They are unarmed prisoners. This is not a vote. This is what we're going to do. This op is compromised. We're going to cut them loose, and we're going to make this peak. When we make this peak, you're going to get comms up. We're going to call for extract, and we're going home. Roger that, sir. Roger that. Roger. But here's the thing. Here's the thing about this story. You guys that don't maybe aren't familiar with this. What this Navy SEAL team did is they're going in to the mountains and they have this operation where they're trying to take out this terrorist leader 
And while they're hiding, a group of, I don't know, herdsmen, I guess, stumble upon them. Completely blows their cover. So they have to tie them up. Now the easy thing for them to do would be just a double tap, pop, pop, and it's over. Ops not compromised, they continue on with their mission, but instead they have to face this choice of do they do what's easy or do they do what's right? And listen to the rules of engagement, let these men go, knowing full well that all they're going to do is make a beeline down from the village and, and tell everybody what's going on, which ultimately is what happens. But then the movie just ramps up from there because they chose what's right. This amazing story starts to happen. You guys check it out after you get your parents' permission. <laughs> now, here's another thing, uh, another way to illustrate this. Um, somebody turned to Isaiah 30 10. I know that's not what I just said, but it's okay. Go to Isaiah 30 10. Somebody read that for me. I don't have my Bible here. Isaiah 30 10. When you got it, read it to me. Yeah. Nice and loud, because I don't think they can hear you back there. What do you catch out of that? They're telling the prophets what? Stop telling us the right thing. Tell us the good things. Stop telling us to do this when we want to do this. Stop telling us the convicting things when we want to hear the pleasurable things. Stop telling us that Jesus wants us to sacrifice when all I want is blessing. Stop! All right, now here's another story. 1 Kings 22, 6 through 8. Go to 1 Kings 22, 6 through 8. I do not have this one either, so I'm going to rely on one of you to find it, okay? Captain, what do you got? Stand up for me. 1 Kings 22, 6 through 8. Um, so the king and Israel got together to talk about 400 men in absence. Shall I go to war with Ramah Gilead, or shall I pray? Go, they answered, for the Lord will give it to me in his hand. But Jehoshaphat asked, asked, Is there not a prophet of the Lord here who we can inquire of? The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, There is still one man for whom we can inquire the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always asks. He is my best son of Israel. Yep. So we got this king who is asking 400 prophets, what do I need to do? Do I attack these guys or not? Every one of them is like, yeah, let's go to war. Here's a ram's horn. You're going to gouge the enemy with it. They're all prophesying good things. And he's just like, come on, I'm tired of the pet rally. I'm tired of the fluff. Is there anybody else? And he says, yeah, there's one more. But all that guy ever does is tell me hard truth. All he ever does is say what's right and not what I want to hear. I hate him. He never said anything good about it. Later on in the story, um, even this prophet goes for what's easy initially, like I did in the wreck. I was like, yeah, let's go. Let's go drink. Let's do that. Even he did that. He came up and he said, yeah, go attack these guys. God's going to give them in your hand. He said, dude, don't lie to me. And that's when he says the right thing instead of the easy. Check out the rest of that story. It's pretty cool. But I wonder if too many of us in ignorance think that the Christian life is going to be or at least easier. Because when it's when it's not, that really tempts our faith to fail. Our faith won't fail when we live a life set apart for God. Doing what's right is being set apart. And I want to show you this. This is a picture of my grandpa who died in 2005. His last words to me. It was an amazing thing. Like I went to visit him, and something, something in the house just kind of was like, this is the end. This is the last time you're going to see him. And so I paid attention to every detail. He, I think he knew it too. And this was like a hardened Navy man that never showed emotion. Everybody feared him. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't want to go to Papa's house because, you know, just, you don't want to do, you're just afraid of the guy. But he, when I was getting ready to leave, he, in his chair, you know, just sitting there lightly rocking. Spit stains all over his robe, reaches out and grabs my wrist. And he musters the strength to open his eyes and look at me. And his lips start to quiver. And I'm like, oh, don't do this. <laughs> don't do this, no. But he's holding on to me. And he says, You can do anything if you have to. And he let go. 
was his last words to me. That was the last thing I ever heard him speak. And really what it was was his final appeal for me to be resilient, to do what's right, not what's easy, to do what's right even when it hurts. And, I mean, that was 10 years ago now. But I still remember that. I mean, just seeing that look in his eyes, that fire, that last burst of flame, like you can do anything you want to have to. That's resonated with me, man. And I think that's what Peter's trying to tell us here is you can do that. Peter has more to say about this, and I'm going to talk about the opposite here. Uh, it's in verse 15. Just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Anytime something's repeated in the Bible, pay attention. That's four times in one verse. All right? The life of the believer is not supposed to be something empty or something that's lived in ignorance. We're called to be holy. All right? To be holy is to be set apart. But how are we to be holy like Jesus? All right? He says, be holy because I am. It's like, what? You're Jesus. How can I do that? Be obedient. Look at both sections of what we're looking at. First Peter. Look at verse 14. What's that word? As... Obedient children. And then verse 22, what's it say? Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying what? Truth. And it goes on to talk about the word. This is how we become holy, is we obey the word. All right? Does this mean, though, that for Jesus to love you, you must excel at following the rules? Not necessarily. The Pharisees were excellent at following the rules, and they're the ones that killed Jesus. Jesus isn't calling us to a life where we have to just be robotic rule followers. We are ones who are freed by the grace of the cross to live in obedience. It's not the other way around, like obedience equals cross. It's cross equals obedience. Okay? In verse 18, it hints at what obedience is not. It's calling religion this empty way of life. And it, it contrasts that with the precious blood of Jesus. So obedience is kind of like uh, like not being deaf, or it's like uh, like if you hear a doorbell, you want to go see who it is, or if somebody opens that door, ninety percent of you are going to go <laughs> like meerkats. All right, it's it's when obedience is when you hear something, you respond to it. Okay, so it's kind of like uh, how many of you like when your phone rings, you send it straight to voicemail, or when you see a text, you pretend you don't see it. Like this guy, hey, sorry I was busy. I sent that two years ago. Look at the timestamp. June 2011, June 2013. How many of you are guilty of that? You see a text, you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. It's like, I saw the dots. Yes, you did. <laughs> or when you, you get a phone call. I mean, do you guys ever answer the phone? I don't think I do. I think anytime my phone rings, I go, hmm, voicemail. I'll get to you later. All right? That's from my parents, even. <laughs> Just like, oh, Dad, you want to talk? I don't! I'll talk to you later. But that's kind of what we do, right? We're all guilty of that, but obedience is different than that. Obedience is hearing that phone ring and that message ding out, and we actually respond. Obedience is when we hear the Word of God and we do the Word of God. And that obedience, according to Scripture here, is it purifies us and it sets us apart from the world. We obtain that purity by doing what the Word says. We don't do what the Word says so that Jesus loves us more. Or because we have to in order to clean our lives up first before coming to church. We don't have to do that, guys. We get to obey. We have the freedom to obey because we know that obedience is better. Because what obedience does is it purifies us and sets us apart. It's doing what's right instead of what's easy, because when you do what's easy, you just get squashed by, this isn't working. Why isn't this working? But when you obey because of the cross, you're finally free to say, you know what? Cape girl doesn't care that she's cape girl. How many of you are so embarrassed to wear that banner of Christ at school? Don't be ashamed of that. Obedience purifies you and sets you apart, as it should. See, faith's not going to fail when you live a life set apart from God. When you sin, preach to yourself. Preach to yourself that you are clean, that you are washed, that you are 
holy, that you are set apart. When you sin, don't make promises that you're going to get it right the next time. That doesn't work. Take it from somebody who's done that for 34 years. Making promises to get it right doesn't work. Being holy, being set apart. That's our aim. That's the aim of our faith. Let your faith be strengthened as you continue to live life more and more set apart from what's normal. So to be set apart, when you actually resolve that your life is going to not only be marked by Christ, but you're going to live in such a way that you are set apart because of Christ, that is going to invite persecution. I've told you stories, countless stories, of what life was like for me as a teenager and as a passionate follower of Jesus. It invites persecution. You're going to be pointed out and left out because you choose to stand out for your family. So look up here. <clears throat> Is it worth it to you? Is that worth it to you? Our faith won't fail when we live a life set apart for God because when you live this kind of life, your faith will be stretched. Your faith will be bent and your faith will be compressed because everything around you is going to say to what's easy, not what's right. And the Holy Spirit inside you is going to say, no, 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 no. Stand firm and do what's right, even when it's hard. You have the resilience to bounce back and live free from an empty way of life that just wants to be. Do you have a resilient faith that knows being set apart for Jesus is better than standing far from Jesus?